record. There is rising anger over the decision to make York's blue badge parking ban permanent. York councillors decided overwhelmingly to ban disabled parking in pedestrian areas in order to implement anti-terror measures. The decision infuriated many impacted who claimed they were treated as second-class citizens. Members of York City Council's executive committee told media that it was necessary to safeguard public safety and take preventative measure against the threat of so-called hostile vehicle attacks. The council acknowledged that some of your 7,500 blue badge holders will lose access to city's food streets. Superintendent Mark Khan, the city's police commander, told BBC that he has fought for hostile vehicle mitigation measure for 10 years, believing that an even such as the Christmas market may attract a terrorist looking to kill as many as possible if no protection are in place. Liberal Democrat councillor Andrew Waller, a member of the council's executive, told BBC, risk remains high and it is urgent that we install the permanent measure. His colleague, Daryl Smalley told BBC, the council faced extremely difficult decision, which they are not taking lightly. Disability rights activists aim to bring a court challenge to a city center ban on blue badge parking. I'll be speaking to Helen Jones of your disability forum today to understand the problem better. Good afternoon, Helen. Thank you very much for the opportunity to interview. That's no problem. Thank you for the chance to have the space to have this conversation. So please explain to us what's going on, what's happening. So it's there's a bit of history to this. Um, at the beginning, um, back in June 2020, some of the streets that we were previously allowed to drive down, um, park on and be dropped off on as blue badge holders were closed to us because um, at that time they said because of the need for social distancing. Um, that was a temporary measure, the closing those streets was a temporary measure, which um, was then extended to allow for pavement cafes um, to be on the pavement, on the streets. Um, and then kind of as the discussion continued, um, the council started formal consultation about making the changes to the foot streets uh, permanent. So that would be permanently not allowing blue badge holders access to some fairly key streets in York. Um, and they voted um, on the 18th of November to make that permanent. So blue badge holders won't be able to drive, be dropped off by a taxi um, on any of those streets between half 10 in the morning and five at night. And the council is looking at um, consulting to extend that to 7 p.m. So if, <clears throat> if you are a blue badge holder who needs to be close to their destination, um, as many do need to, or you need to be close to your vehicle for other reasons, um, you know, medical equipment, that kind of thing. Um, basically, taking out our access to those streets makes it almost impossible for us to visit York City Centre. Thank you. Would you please explain to our viewers who are not from the UK, or who are not familiar with what is blue badge and 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 what's the implication of these changes 
So a blue badge is it's, it's basically an adjustment that acknowledges that for some disabled people, um, they can't walk very far, they, they can't travel very far, um, whether that's in a wheelchair or otherwise. Um, and the blue badge acknowledges that and basically tries to kind of level the playing field a bit um, by allowing us to park in particular areas um, that somebody without a blue badge couldn't. So if you've got a big multi-storey car park, we would be able to park um, near to the point to leave that car park to you know go shopping or whatever. Um, it means we're able to park close to a shop in a kind of shop car park. Um, and then in um, before this decision was made, the blue badge meant we were allowed access to streets that those um, traveling in vehicles that didn't have a blue badge couldn't. So it acknowledged um, that we, we do need to be closer to our destinations and we do need to be able to return to our vehicles quickly for multiple reasons to do with disability. Um, so that in itself is what is considered a reasonable adjustment. So you get a blue badge, um, there's various criteria, but if you're getting one because of your mobility, the chances are you can't walk 50 meters. And if you can walk 80 meters or more, you almost certainly won't get a blue badge. Um, in reality, 50 meters is not very far and you have to be able to get from where you are to the place you're going and back again. So realistically, that cuts down that distance quite significantly. Um, so it sounds like it has a huge impact on those people. It already they were trying to find a way to move around and do things in, in within, within, within the structure, disabling structure we have in the society that makes them disabled and, and calls them disabled. But they are, but so, so where we are now in terms of human rights violation, is it a human rights violation? In UN, UK's first UN recognized UN UK's first human rights city. It's shocking that this has been able to happen in a human rights city. Um, it when when people find that out, it, it sort of they can't put the two together. We already had limited access to the city centre. So, um, for example, I think in your opening, you quoted Mark Kahn, who is the superintendent of North Yorkshire Police, um, saying that he feels that the Christmas market is a very real threat, for a uh, very real risk um, for a terror attack. And I mean, the, there is very real reason to think that it's a very crowded space. Um, it's quite compact, but we don't have access to those streets anyway. The streets that we had access to were limited and they allowed us to get further into the city um, through those kind of key routes. Um, in terms of York being a human rights city and kind of human rights violation side of this, we we are we haven't got the right to access our city centre anymore. Um, that's that's kind of been lost for many of us with that. We haven't if if you are able to access the city centre um, as a disabled person with a blue badge, now that quite often means you're reliant on someone else. So having to have somebody who pushes your wheelchair or um assist you in some other ways. So there is a right around um, independence and just non-discrimination as well. I mean, that's quite a fundamental right. And the council um, and the police are sort of using the human right to life um, 
to erase our human rights. They're saying that the threat of this potential terror attack outweighs our very real day-to-day -day lives that are being destroyed because of what the council has chosen to do. Um, and if we look at recent terror attacks, I mean, um, sort of Liverpool, for example, having reduced vehicle access wouldn't have stopped that. As, as terrible as it was, it, the measures the council are putting in place to keep out blue badge holders would not have stopped that. It, it's hard to discuss this constructively with the council when everything that we are suggesting just gets knocked back. So vehicles like emergency services will be allowed access to the foot streets, um, as you would hope, um, and they will be allowed access through a CCTV um, sort of system. And it was suggested that we could hold our blue badges up to the camera to say, you know, we, we are allowed access. We, we, are, we are one of those few vehicles that are allowed in these spaces. And that was um, dismissed because people might fake a blue badge. It... And, and what was your response to that? Did, did you have any chance to respond to them? Consult them? Um, this information came out in a report um, at the beginning of November, I believe. Um, that it was a report that had been that the council had commissioned. It was an independent report, and it was buried within a thousand pages of documents. So it it felt like it was intentionally hidden from us, and there was no real way of responding or raising it with the council after we found it. Um, we were able to participate in the, at the beginning of the executive meeting, there's a three minute slot for the public. And despite many, many disabled people and disability groups raising problems and raising concerns and raising our human rights in those three minute sections, they still went ahead and made the decision to keep us out, essentially. And you went to the executive committee meeting and you begged them not to take this decision. You cried. And that, that was very difficult for me to see. Uh, the city was watching. It was not yeah. a, you went there. Uh, and the people were watching people like me and others. It's a human rights issue, very clearly human rights issue. Was three minutes enough? Are, are you heard? Or other human, uh, uh, other, other rights activists like you? So what do you want to tell them? What do you want to tell these executive committee members? I'm, I mean, there's so much that I want to tell them. Um, there was so much that was said when they were debating the issue that made it so clear there was a fundamental lack of understanding of disability um, and what it's like to be disabled. Um, that that one, one solution that kept getting raised was um, a shuttle bus system, which will work for some disabled people, but it will not work for the most kind of impacted by this, getting out of your own vehicle, your own specialist vehicle in many cases, into another vehicle to get dropped off in the city center. And then if you need to leave urgently because your disability means that you do, and for, for whatever reason, you, you then have to wait for the shuttle bus to get back to where your car is parked, to get into your own vehicle and um, I use an electric wheelchair a lot of the time and just getting into my vehicle is not a quick process. It takes, you know, a good few minutes to kind of get me in, get it all locked down and get it all safe and secure before we can drive off. Um, 
the there was so much that just showed their lack of knowledge about disability, about the social model of disability as well. I mean, what they have done has disabled us. It has made us more disabled and less independent. You were not heard, you were not recognized. Your ex lived experience were not uh, taken into consideration. No, not in, it didn't feel like it was even on their radar. They sat, they watched 20 something people speak at the beginning of that meeting. They watched me sit in front of them and cry as I tried to read my statement out. They watched that and yet when they reached the point where they were debating the issue, I, I don't even know if they remembered seeing me. I don't know if they heard me. There was certainly no way of me knowing they had heard or paid any attention to what I've said. And I've made statements in similar meetings before and the councillors have been there flicking through papers and kind of turning on their laptops and things. It's not genuine participation if firstly you only get three minutes, but secondly, there is no guarantee that you are even being listened to. And if it appears that you're being listened to, are you actually being heard? And we don't think they can be hearing us because we've said, we've been talking about this issue for 18 months. We've raised all the many problems and solutions for them. And there's just no evidence that any of that has been heard by the people who ultimately made the decision. So the, 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 there is a lack of empathy there. There is a huge lack of empathy and willingness to listen and take action. Not only listening, yes. taking action based on, based on what you have said. And there is equality duty and there is, is a human rights violation. And wh wh where, what, what do you want in an ideal situation? What, what do you want to happen? There's a few things, to be honest. I think if the council um, can learn from this, learn that they actually do need to understand disability a bit more um, and do that training and do that kind of work. Um, I think they need human rights training um, because they clearly do not understand human rights. And I think ultimately, obviously what we want is access to our city centre and what, whatever way that is, we've made so many suggestions, you know, there could be a system where we apply for a permit. If a blue badge can be faked too easily, maybe we can apply for a council permit and then that would give us access. Um, and an apology. We've given hours and hours of our time for free to them. We have told them all the very, very different real ways this will impact upon us. And to not be listened to repeatedly, it just, that for me is sending a really strong message about what they think about disabled people. It doesn't, they don't seem to think we're worth listening to. That, that we are, as you said at the start, somehow second-class citizens. And so our access to our city centre doesn't matter. Our time that we have given them doesn't matter. And our voices and what we are saying and raising doesn't matter. So what was the next step then? Why some groups are saying they will bring legal action and what uh, what your organization is going to do to address the situation? So you're absolutely right. There is uh, legal advice being sought that was crowdfunded and within about 36 hours had reached its target of 5,000 pounds, which was incredible. Um, so that is just to establish if we think, if, if the lawyer thinks we have a case. 
Um, and then obviously if we do that, the next step will be um, fundraising to have enough money to take that case, um, take that case forward. There's also um, an aspect of this around the um, United Nations and the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Um, so at the moment, there is a shadow report being written by various different groups across the UK to tell um, the, U the UN basically is the UK as a whole meeting its right, meeting its um, responsibilities? Is it is it treating disabled people well? And we will be we have submitted um, some of the evidence. Um, some evidence, the statement that the York City Human Rights Network um, wrote and was in, was sent to the council, that's been sent off. Um, we, we would like it to be realized that our human rights are, the, are as important as other people's human rights. Um, and so it does feel like there's this kind of two kind of pronged um, approach between legal and then kind of the human rights aspect and alongside that work um, something that I'm very keen on is making sure that we make sure make sure that so many more people are aware of this um, since the decision was made permanent there has been absolute outrage on social media people cannot believe this has happened and I mean, it, is, it, 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 it goes beyond belief, really, that it has happened. But I think it did go to show just um, that not everybody was aware of what was going on um, or had somehow got enough optimism that they wouldn't make the decision permanent and that it'd only be because of COVID. So raising awareness with people who aren't disabled, um, who aren't blue badge holders and raising awareness on a kind of more national level as well um, because if it can happen in York a human rights city there is nothing to stop this being done in every other city in the country um, so it's not even just a York issue anymore it's it's set kind of a platform for other cities to do the same and in terms of people who aren't disabled both in, in and outside York You, they, they are also part of our society and society should be interdependent. It should be looking out for everybody. Um, and as horrific as it is, uh, disability is one of the kind of main minorities in which somebody can become part of uh, overnight. I mean, just because someone's not disabled now doesn't mean they won't be in the future. We've got an aging population as well. And just because you're not disabled now doesn't mean you aren't going to meet somebody tomorrow and fall in love with them and they're disabled or you might end up with a disabled kid. I mean, you know, the, I think it's the statistic, I think, is about a quarter of families include someone who's got a disability. So if you don't currently know somebody who is disabled, you probably will do uh, sometime very soon. Um, or perhaps you just aren't aware that person is disabled. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a matter for everybody. It, it is a matter of human rights. It's a, it's a issue that everyone needs to be concerned. And if people, if people from UN mechanism and academic and scholars are listening to this, what, what is your message for academic, academics and people within the UN mechanism who, who will be possibly will be listening to this uh, or watching or listening both? Um, a couple of things, basically, if you think you can help us progress the human rights argument, please do get in touch. Um, we, York Disability Rights Forum is not um, an expert in human rights um, and all the help we can get on that will be fantastic um i think part of it is the same as what it would be for anybody listening is just make sure you tell people about what's going on um and if you are somebody who perhaps has some more power um 
put pressure on those that you can if they are somehow part of that chain that can make a difference and overturn this decision and just support us and help us. Thank you. And you you are not asking for any mercy, you are asking for equal rights, human rights, and that need to be respected. That's, that that need to be clear. It's, it's, it's about human rights. It's, it's to be treated equally as a human being. And yeah. th th thank you for your time. Thank you. No, so that's no problem. Thank you for having me.